Good morning. Can you hear me at the very back? Yeah? Good morning, and thank you for coming along this morning to the Diversity and Inclusion Seminar being organized by the Dyslexia Support Group in collaboration with the GFSB and the kind sponsorship from the Consumer Trust, the Hyperion Group of Companies, the Jibanko Group, Brightnet, and EY. Now, before we start, um, just a gentle reminder, if you haven't done so already, uh, to place your mobiles on silent. Keep them handy because you'll be able to message your questions to the panel, to the different speakers this morning. And you can do so on the WhatsApp number, 540-77511. And you can see that number again in your program specifically. Now, this morning, I've asked you to put your mobiles in silent, on silent because we're here to listen this morning. For too long, dyslexia has often been associated with something negative. This morning, our speakers are going to place the spotlight on the positives of dyslexia, particularly in the workplace. Now, across the decades and across the world, um, we see many people prove that there are benefits to dyslexia and uh, many prominent figures. And this morning, we're going to be rediscovering dyslexia. I'm going to keep my interventions uh, brief. It's, uh, it's going to be a long morning. If not, I can, I can really talk. And we're going to be rediscovering dyslexia. And we've got a little video produced, uh, the first dyslexia uh, produced video. And um, let's rediscover dyslexia. What is dyslexia? Dyslexia is a language-based learning difference. It affects the organization in the brain that controls the ability to process the way language is heard, spoken, read, or spelled. Dyslexia varies in degrees of severity and may not be immediately obvious. A child may read with apparent ease, but struggles with spellings. Another child may find reading and spelling equally challenging. The benefits of being dyslexic is that you see the world through a different lens. That gives you, I guess, gives you some different qualities compared to other people, right? So you have different strengths compared to others. My gifts are that I have an excellent 3D perspective. I have a, an exceptional spatial awareness. Driving cars, I know it sounds really stupid, but maybe like parking and stuff like that, I'm quite good at those things. With dyslexia, you're able to put things together uh, that actually physically you can't see. It teaches you how to cope with differences, differences that we all have. It teaches you to understand them. It teaches you to adapt to how you can deal with them. And ultimately, it teaches you how to be successful with that difference. I don't know. I, try, I tried hard. So I, wouldn't, I can't look back at myself and say, you know, you should have cracked on a bit more because I did. I was told that I wouldn't be able to go to university. Um, and I did that. One of the best things I did at school was get my O-level English. It took me five attempts to get my five uh, out of English. I then got my HND when I was 20 years old with distinctions. I got my master's degree when I was 34 and I'm presently studying for my PhD. The main reason why I'm doing this and the main reason I focus on dyslexia is because of my daughter and I want her to see it not as a disability, not as something that's going to hold you back. And my aim was to do this, to raise awareness, to show that it's all kinds of people have dyslexia and it doesn't matter and it doesn't, it, I don't want to say it doesn't hold you back, it makes things more difficult for sure, but you can overcome those difficulties with some hard work. We didn't have those role models uh, to prove and, and to give us examples of how you can overcome dyslexia. So we've got those these days and I think those are vital for young people. Walt Disney, the cut. He invented Mickey Mouse. My advice to my younger self would be not to be so embarrassed about not being able to read or spell. Um, it doesn't make you dumb. You can still achieve a lot more. But with dyslexia, as I've mentioned before, it's about don't hide it, embrace it, use it to make you a better person. Dyslexia does not define you, it is a gift. For more information, please find us at www.dyslexia.gi. Now we can spend the entire morning talking and talking about dyslexia, but I believe there's nothing better than listening. And listening particularly to people who live experiences and um, listening to their personal journeys, listening to um, the challenges they face, and even better, listening to how they overcome those challenges. Personal stories are key to understanding issues, learning how people live with them. And um, this morning, we're going to be listening to a number of personal stories. And next on stage is a man who is here in Gibraltar in a very official capacity. But um, over the last three years, he's become very integrated, I think we'll all agree, 
into the community. He's become very much part of the community. And he's allowed us, uh, very kindly, um, an insight into aspects of his personality as well. And today, he's been very kind, and he's going to be sharing his personal story with us. Um, on stage now, the patron for the Dyslexia Support Group, His Excellency the Governor, Ed Davis. Ladies and gentlemen, good, good morning. And um, this is me. This is, this is Ed Davis. I'm a dyslexic. And this is who I'm meant to be. And um, I'm very proud to be a dyslexic. And I'm very proud that this is the first time in my 56 year, I know not many of you think I'm that old, but I am, 56 year old life, but I've stood on a stage like this and had the confidence and the courage to say, this is me, and I'm dyslexic. And it hasn't always been that way. If I go back to being born in Hereford, made in the Royal Marines, my current phase of my life being defined, defined in Gibraltar, I've gone through being orchestrated and ostracized and judged um, as a kid that couldn't read. I felt separated. Nobody really understood what it was. The way to deal with it was to separate you and give you extra reading. And that was as bad as sophisticated as it was. I've been ridiculed as a 34-year-old major in the Royal Marines who uh, couldn't read the lines when I was doing an audition for the Defence Academy Christmas play. And then I transitioned through to standing up in Exeter Cathedral, reading the eulogies for the 23 very brave men and women who died during my time commanding the task force, the British task force in, in Helmand, Afghanistan. And I was humbled by my ability to do that and, and what they did and what they represented. And then I come through to the privilege of giving my swearing-in speech in the Gibraltar Parliament when I took over from government. Yeah. So that in a snapshot, is, is the journey that I've done, and it's led me to, to being here today to have the courage and confidence to admit and embrace dyslexia in a way that I've never done in my life. And Stuart and his team in the Gibraltar Dyslexic Support Group have been decisive in getting me to this point. You know, 56 years... It's the first time that I've actually engaged with people and with an organization that truly understands the nature of dyslexia. So it's great for me to be here today to have the opportunity to share a little bit of what I think um, dyslexia is all about and also to just make my contribution as a very proud patron of the Dyslexia Group, just to say thank you to the brilliant work that is being done by, by Stuart and his team. I came across uh, the lyrics for one of the great songs that's come out of the, the film, The Greatest Showman. The uh, song is called this is, this is Me, and I just want to read it to you, because I think it reflects very well the journey that I've walked somewhat slowly and where I started off and where, where I ended up. So if you just bear with me and listen to the words, because I think it certainly encapsulates my journey, and I suspect it encapsulates quite a few. Is it three and a half thousand Gibraltarians have got dyslexia, or is it 6,000? But it's somewhere in that, that area. 10 to 20% of Gibraltarians have dyslexia in one form or the other. So here are the words from... This is me from The Greatest Showman. I'm not a stranger to the dark. Hide away, they say. Because we don't want your broken parts. I've learned to be ashamed of all my scars. Run away, they say. No one will love you as you are. But I won't let them break me down to dust. I know there's a place for us. 
for we are glorious, for we are dyslexics. I make no apologies, this is me. I am who I am meant to be. I know there is a place for me. And there was only four additional words in that that I placed in. Um, and you probably guess which those four, four were. But, you know, I think dyslexics now, through the great work of people like Stuart and the Dyslexia, Dyslexia Support Group, um, probably know where they are. But I fear that some of the families, some of the institutions, some of the nations within which they live don't know where that place is. And they don't know how to find that place, how to engage in that place, and how to use that place for the collective good of all, whether it's in the family place, the school place, the business place. So I think this is a, an inspired opportunity for us to actually correct that. And I think the aim for me of this morning is really to try and make, whether it's the family, whether it's the school, but mainly focused, I think, from the attendance today into the, the business era, what can we do to make you know, Gibraltar the, the first business community that truly understands the power of dyslexia, truly embraces the power of dyslexia, and truly harnesses the benefit of the power of dyslexia. So that, for me, is the aim. And I'm very grateful to the sponsors that have come on board uh, with the Dyslexia Support Group, primarily the partnership with Julian and his team at the Federation of Small Businesses, and then the sponsors that uh, Kevin, Kevin read out. Wouldn't have happened with you, without you, sorry. And I'm very conscious I'm the warm-up act for the, the true experts in this room. We've got Kate Griggs here, who uh, is the CEO of Made by Dyslexia. And we also have Ben Cook, who comes from EY and is their senior strategy consultant. I'd love to be one of those one day. I've spent 35 years trying to work out what strategy is, so looking forward to that. There's one thing in this room that we all have in common. And that is difference. And going back to the aim as I've talked about, my, my view to be able to harness the power of that difference, and we're talking about the difference that is dyslexia today, is to have the personal and professional humility to value, respect, embrace the contribution and skills of others. And if you don't have that humility, whether you're an individual, whether you're a family, or whether you're an institution, you'll never be the best that you could possibly be. So for me, it's all about how do we harness difference to make the whole far greater of all the little differences that are in the, this room today. And what I'd like to do is just give you a few examples from my military career, where, yes, there was dyslexia involved in it, but that um, is only a small part of it. But I want to try and set the conditions for the two experts who truly know about dyslexia by just talking about how I've seen the power of combinations, the power of difference, the power of diversity make a phenomenal, immense difference in, in my military career. And the first one is on the, on the human level, and it's about a, a young, young man called James Cobby, who was a Royal Marine recruit. He never got beyond being a Royal Marine recruit because he was injured catastrophically during commando training. And he fell off a zip wire as he was coming down on the commando assault course, and he catastrophically broke, broke his back. And he was unable to even blink an eye. And the prognosis was that's how he would remain for the, the rest of his days. But through his own personal belief in the institution that he was trying to join, which was the Royal Marines, he was there for three months before the injury. Through the tireless, relentless love and care from his mother and his father, and through the skill 
of the, the doctors, physiotherapists, and all the support staff. Over a three-year period, 24-7, applying the belief, the love, and the skill. Three years later, when I was the commander of the Royal Marines, James Cobby stood up from his wheelchair, and we were in the tar court in, in the Tower of London. He stood up, he was blinking, he was smiling, he saluted me, and I presented him with an honorary green berry. So on a human level, we saw there the power of those combinations, whether it was the belief, whether it was the love, whether it was the skill. Any one of its own was great, but it was never going to get James for a life in a bed, not blinking, through to a life which he could actually contribute and feel that he had value. My second story is uh, one on a sort of organizational basis. When I was commander Task Force Helmand, which was the British forces contingent in Afghanistan, in Helmand province. This was in April to uh, October 2011. The task force was 6,500 strong men and women, came from three nations, 105 different units from those three nations. We came together, worked up, trained together for six months. We deployed for six months. And the impact of those six and a half thousand people over that six month period, we saw a 45% drop in the violence. We built 14 schools. So next administration has got some work to do in Gibraltar to keep up with us. Uh, and we've got built eight health centers and we brought 80,000 Almandis out of the, the yoke of the Taliban into safe areas. And that was a team effort harnessing all the individual bits. But the real heart of the story I wanted to say was that at the heart of that, the heart of that six and a half thousand people, there were three individuals who made a phenomenal, completely out of proportion impact. One of them was a, an Estonian counter-improvised explosive device operator who, if he'd been in the, the British military, we would have never allowed him to come anywhere near being qualified as a counter-IED expert. Because he, he hadn't done a course. His equipment wasn't three million pounds worth of the latest ground-penetrating radar. It was a wooden pole with a bit of rope and a hook. But that uh, very brave young man, over the six-month period, neutralized, found and neutralized over 100 IEDs, about 20% of the ones that we neutralized across the whole task force. That's just one individual. Because he was different, but we took a risk on him. And he was prepared to take the risk himself. The second individual was the, the vet. We had vet with us because we have lots of dogs these days on operations. Very useful. Um, we sort of forgot how useful they were. But we had vets with us to obviously look after them. And one of, one of our problems was getting into the compounds where the families were and, and where the women and children were. Because they know they're over 50% of the population. We just couldn't talk to them. So the vet came up with the idea, why don't I offer to go in and look after uh, Helmandi's most priceless asset, which is his animals, which he did. And through that, he had conversations that gave us insights that were, again, critical to what we wanted to do. So again, a vet, generating intelligence. It's not the normal way you do things, but we embraced what he uniquely offered, and it made a difference. And then the final person who did have dyslexia was uh, one of my plans officers. And she was uh, a royal electrical and mechanical engineer who, I have to say, people were not convinced in my Royal Marine headquarters. Not a lot of women in there. Certainly not a lot of men, 
uh, members of the of the army from the the, the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. But she had an ability to understand systems and seek out opportunities and project forward how things weren't happening, should happen, which again saved an awful lot of lives and contributed massively out of proportion to one person and six and a half thousand, 45 percent reduction in violence. So my message is, the thing that is common to all of us, and if we're clever, the thing that actually can make a difference for all of us, is embracing that difference for the greater good. And dyslexia is one of those differences that can make a real difference if we embrace it and we learn how to use it to the benefit of all. So enough from me. We'll hand over to the experts who will tell us how we can and why we should harness the power of difference, harness the power of dyslexia. Thank you very much. Now, just a reminder, um, remember you can submit your questions uh, to the speakers this morning, and you can do so, just in case you haven't got a program with you, I'll read out that number once again. It's 540-77511, and you can send your messages via text or WhatsApp. Um, now, um, thank you very much for sharing your story, Your Excellency. Um, now, she launched, back two years ago, she launched um, a global charity, a global charity that is working very hard to help the rest of us understand and better support dyslexia. She managed to get very prominent people involved in the charity, um, very successful people who are dyslexics themselves, and no doubt their success helps to prove that we need to stop believing the myth that, that dyslexia is a negative. Now, amongst them, um, Sir Richard Branson <laughs> says it all, doesn't it? And um, this morning, sharing her insight with us, um, and the great work that she's doing, and also the benefits of dyslexia. Kate Briggs, the founder and CEO of Made by Dyslexia. Good morning, everybody. I'll just try and get this laptop to work. Fantastic. Um, so, as uh, that introduction very kindly said, Made by Dyslexia is a global charity, and we have two global goals. The first one is to help the world properly understand and value dyslexia, and the second is to level the playing field so all children get the support they need, and also that through into work that adults get the support they need. Uh, I'd like to start this morning by just playing uh, the campaign film from, um, the, from our launch. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to have a chat to you about dyslexia. Anyone be interested in having a dyslexic baby? What the hell kind of a question is that? World's first dyslexic sperm bank. Open today. Tell me, what do you know about dyslexia? You know, disability. A lot of people think that people with dyslexia are stupid. Only 3% of people see dyslexia as anything other than a disadvantage. But look at the people around this room. Steve Jobs, Albert Einstein. We've got a whole catalogue here full of people who uh, are or were dyslexic, like Thomas Edison, Henry Ford. Dyslexics have a difference in their brains that makes them literally see the world a bit differently. Did you know that 40% of self-made millionaires are dyslexic? Say that again. What? That's amazing. It hasn't held any of them back. Dyslexia should be viewed as a different way of thinking. And today, a new charity, Made by Dyslexia, the charity which is backed by Sir Richard Branson, not to establish sperm banks that would accept donations only from people with dyslexia. If you were thinking about how most people see dyslexia, what, what words do you think people would use to describe them? 
but uh, at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. But by the sounds of it, they're not. So as you can probably gather, our mission is to make a lot of noise and to get a lot of people focusing um, on dyslexia. And we have some fantastic creative minds working in agencies across the world to, to help us do that. And obviously, we weren't seriously opening a dyslexic sperm bank. Um, I'd like to start by just sharing my story with you. Uh, this is my brother and I. Uh, don't you just love those 1960s photographs? Um, my entire family is dyslexic. Uh, my father was uh, a, a crazy scientist who actually invented the grow bag. Um, my aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, cousins. Uh, I have two dyslexic sons and um, I even married a dyslexic, so clearly like attracts like. Um, my brother and I were really lucky because we were sent to uh, one of the first schools, or actually the first school in the world, that recognized how to support dyslexia, um, but also that with dyslexia came this huge pattern of strengths. And um, the school was founded on, on the basis that dyslexics are brilliant, they think differently, and we'll give them the right support and they will flourish. Um, that school is Millfield School, which is now one of the most uh, successful private or public schools in the UK. Um, I'd just like to tell you the story of Milford because it's, it's a really, really fascinating story. Uh, it was set up by um, a very forward-thinking educationalist called Boss Mayer. And um, Boss was tutoring the Indian royal family's children uh, over in India. There were five princes. And it got to the age where the um, royal family were very keen that the, the kids were sent over to the UK to benefit from a British public education system. And um, one of the boys clearly had dyslexia, or word blindness, as I think it was probably called back in those days. Um, and Boss did the rounds of Eton, Harrow, Stowe, all the top private schools. And everywhere he went, this one particular boy was being turned away. They weren't prepared to accept him because they said that he was educationally subnormal. So Boss was absolutely fascinated about this because in his mind, <clears throat> that was the boy who was the brightest. He was the one that he thought had the most potential. So Boss actually set about finding out about dyslexia, uh, and he went over to Columbia University, and he met two professors there, Professors Orton and Gillingham, who had come up with a methodology to teach dyslexic children to read. Um, he was blown away by the su successes that they were having, so he actually sent a team of teachers over to Columbia University to train in this methodology. He then came back to the UK, and um, he happened to meet the Clarks family, who were Clarks Shoes, uh, who um, all of the children were struggling to learn to read, actually were all dyslexic. And the Clarks family gave Boss a building and a site in Somerset to set up the school. He then went around to all the top private schools, Stowe, Eton, Harrow, and said to them, okay, you send me your duffers, all the kids that you can't educate, and I'm going to turn them around, and I'm going to, to make them successful students. So that caused a, a, a lot of uh, merriment with all of, all of the schools who just thought, you know, he's mad, he's not going to be able to do it. But Boss also then went to all of the parents of these duffers who weren't going to be able to continue in mainstream school. Uh, and he asked them to pay four times the going rate they would pay at Stowe or, or Eton. Um, and he was then able to give away three scholarships. So for every child that went there paying a huge amount of money, the other children were, he was able to scour the country and find talented children who were struggling. Um, as I was doing my research uh, into dyslexic thinking skills, Millfield very kindly uh, opened their alumni books to me and let me um, reach out to all of the old Millfieldians. And what was absolutely striking was the number of, of dyslexic people who have gone on to do the most extraordinary things in the world. And a lot of them were on full scholarship, so it wasn't just the, the rich and privileged kids. So um, with every single thing from one of the leading scientists in fusion power in America, very dyslexic, turned away by every other school, but Millfield turned him around. People who've gone on to be huge in the film industry and all the creative industries that we know about, but really completely across the board. Um, 
So the next part of my story is my son, Ted, who is uh, actually now 26. He gets very embarrassed when I show people this picture. Um, Ted is the reason that I'm doing what I'm doing. When Ted was, as soon as he could walk, it was so clear to me that he was dyslexic because he was incredibly creative, incredibly imaginative, um, just very musical, very into performance. He knew every single dinosaur's name. He could recognize every species of dinosaur, but he struggled to actually say the word. So he, had, he, had, he was a textbook dyslexic. Um, and when he started school, I very proudly went into the school saying, now my son's dyslexic, so you, you do now, you will pick it up and you'll be able to support it. Um, and they assured me that they knew everything about dyslexia and they could help him and it would be fine. Um, but they repeatedly kept saying, we're not seeing any signs, we're not seeing any signs. And Ted went from a really bubbly, happy child, full of imagination and, and hope and dreams, to a child who was very withdrawn, hated school. Um, he just changed in literally a space of, of probably two or three months. Um, and that absolutely incensed me because when I went into school, the school eventually admitted that they didn't have anybody in the school that was trained in dyslexia and that they bring somebody in to do some special tests, but they actually knew nothing about it. So I was completely shocked that we were sort of 30 years on from 20 eight years on from when I'd been at school, and I knew everything I knew about dyslexia and the strengths and how to support dyslexics, but it wasn't happening in the education system. So I trained in dyslexia, um, and I then, uh, we actually moved to Somerset to send our kids to, to Millfield, and, and they've both flourished. Um, but uh, what I also did was I then set up a charity called Extraordinary People. This is way back in 2005. Um, and we campaigned very hard with Tony Blair's government, who eventually listened, which probably was helped by a fly-on-the-wall BBC One documentary. Um, but they actually did an official review into dyslexia. They agreed with everything that we'd said, which is that all teachers need to be trained, um, that there was a methodology that should be happening in schools, and that was actually good teaching for all children. Um, and everything looked exceptionally good. Um, but sadly, we then had a change of government, and it's very difficult to follow things through. And a lot of the changes that the UK government have made to education are very detrimental to dyslexics. So that's why I started Made by Dyslexia two and a half years ago, to, to again start campaigning for change. Um, I mentioned dyslexic thinking skills. I'm not going to talk through them a lot because Ben has a wonderful presentation he's going to do with EY, but I'll just put a little bit of context around it. We know what dyslexic should, what should be happening for dyslexic children. We know they need to be identified early, they need to be given the right support, and we need to focus on their strengths. And we have decades of that evidence. We absolutely know what should be happening. And if you can afford it, you can go and buy that support. But the problem is it isn't in all schools, and it has to be in all schools. And there's an urgency around this now, because these thinking skills are exactly what the future needs. And our work with EY, when we actually did the, the um, EY report, um, was very much to focus on that and to, to understand that there is this huge value in our workforce most of it is untapped, and we need to change our focus and come together as a world and really do something about it. But the problem is, from our research last year, 91% of people say that their schools have no understanding, or almost no understanding of dyslexic thinking skills. So clearly, we have to start with education. Last year, we partnered with Microsoft because technology is with us, Everybody can access technology, and if we can actually create teacher training and tools for schools to use that are free, then we can change this very quickly globally. Um, we launched our first uh, uh, project with Microsoft uh, in January, which was um, some dyslexia awareness training. Uh, the training has now been taken by 150,000 people around the world. Uh, it's free, it's online, it's video-based, it's very informative and very short. 
We believe that every single person in education, every teacher, every person who works in schools, anybody who works in education, anybody who works in government and education should at the very least spend an hour doing this course because it will tell you so much and it's really, really vital. I'm going to play the first module of this. It's a short film um, just for you to see what it's all about. If you're dyslexic, it's kind of your superpower. It's like the way that you think. Our brains, uh, they're wired to, I think, process information differently. It's just the way that you see the world. I don't think people do think the way I think. The way I see the world might be different from somebody else, but that's valid. In fact, it's vital. Dyslexics literally think differently. We have a different wiring of the brain, which means that we're really good at certain things, but we have real challenges at more traditional education and learning. The dyslexic brain actually processes information differently. So while it manifests itself in reading, writing, and spelling, and that's where it's most obvious, it's really a difference in how information comes into the brain and is processed which can create difficulties, certainly in an academic setting, but also amazing opportunities and abilities. Their minds work in very diverse ways. They're able to see the world in a way that we are not. So dyslexia is very common. We now know it's about one out of five students are dyslexic. So if you're a teacher, you've had a dyslexic student in your class. The strengths they have are incredible. The way they can think around things the ability to see the big picture. They are problem solvers, they are outside the box thinkers. Creative in the way that they can come up with solutions and ideas, but also in the way that they can invent new things. They are curious learners who are eager to explore. They have had to develop other alternative paths, so those elements of them often become then practiced, rehearsed and better functioning. They tend to be innovators, uh, they tend to be entrepreneurs. They're spirited, they're often really good with people. A lot of dyslexic learners tend to be daydreamers, uh, uh, but while they're sitting there, they're not uh, not paying attention or being disrespectful. Uh, oftentimes they're really coming up with in innovative solutions. Dyslexia is neurological. You could look at a dyslexic brain and you would see that it was behaving in a different way. The average thinker may get from A to B very quickly. It's like they're on a highway. But what I tell my students is that the dyslexic brain is more like you're taking the scenic route. And it may take them longer to get from A to B, but think of all the things they're going to see. We now know that uh, dyslexia is definitely genetic. And if a parent struggled with reading, if a parent had a difficult time in school, there's at least a 50% chance that their, their child is going to struggle as well. We also know that if a parent struggled and then a sibling is diagnosed with dyslexia, uh, the brother or sister has more than a 75% chance. So it is very important for parents to be aware, um, especially be looking for those signs early on with your child. We can start identifying uh, a child as being dyslexic really as early as four to five years old. I would be looking for a direct mismatch between what a student is capable of and what they know versus the output of learning. Students who are falling behind peers in letter recognition and matching sounds to letters um, or might be inconsistent in it. Big red flags for us for what we look for are the inability to name common objects quickly, to memorize things that seem every day and easy, um, days of the week, months of the year, putting the months of the year in order. Anything that requires retrieval, anything that requires remembering something instantly and bringing it back. It can affect how you work with numbers. It really affects how you sequence things. The earlier we can identify a child as dyslexic, and also the earlier we can help a child understand their strengths and weaknesses, the more of a profound impact that we can have. We need to be screening all students early and frequently. A dyslexic child should know they're dyslexic and they should know what dyslexia is and that is almost the most powerful thing that we can give them. It's empowering, that label's empowering because it stops being about you, it becomes about a difference, a different way of doing something. The parents knowing that a student is dyslexic really gives them the pathway to start walking down, that there's a direction that they can go in now. And for the teacher, it helps to know that there's a reason why 
they are not memorizing their spelling words, or there's a reason why they can't read. For decades, uh, really 50, 60 years, we've had a, a fairly solid understanding of what we need to do. What a dyslexic learner needs at the end of the day is a strong phonics instruction that's grounded in a multi-sensory approach. And by multi-sensory, what we mean is that we want to engage all the different senses or the way in which the brain learns and processes information. Anything you need to do to support a dyslexic child is great teaching practice for all children. No one suffers when we build classrooms to support dyslexic learners. In fact, everyone uh, is only made better because of it. Teachers, parents, employers, really the world needs to be more aware of the definition of dyslexia. To understand that a child is dyslexic is not rocket science. There are steps that we can take, there are screeners that we can begin to use, there are things that we can look for in order to recognize that this child thinks differently and that we need to provide them the support and the approach to education that resonates and makes sense to them. We want to be able to democratize this support and help teachers all around the world to be able to understand what dyslexia is, to understand the huge value of dyslexic thinking and the real importance of identifying it and supporting it early. Imagine a world where you've got, you know, a little, where you've got like a force of people who have this gift of dyslexia educated in a way that supports them. It means anything's possible, you know. It means anything is possible. I love my job. Interviewing people like Orlando Bloom is really hard work. <laughs> um, so y you see, we know what needs to happen. Um, the the uh, American voices in that film were from uh, the first school in America that supported dyslexia, based in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, it was set up in the 1970s by a very passionate dyslexic man with dyslexic children. Um, we're actually working very closely with that school. Um, we're doing some incredible work over there in the, the next training modules that we're creating. Um, we're working at Thomasville Heights, which is a school that is located right next door to Georgia State Prison. Um, right next door to um, the projects, uh, which is one of the poorest estates in the whole of America. Um, very, very underprivileged children. Uh, a terrible trajectory of going from underprivileged into prison. Um, and we're breaking that cycle because we know that if you look across the prison population, unemployed people, mental health issues, the the downside of not addressing dyslexia is something that should concern every single country because it's, it's real, it's very real. We choose not to highlight that because we are all about the positives. But it is important that we as a world look at uh, and take responsibility for what is not happening in our schools and needs to change. Um, last year, we held the first ever Global Dyslexia Summit. Um, I'll share the highlights film from it in a moment, but our next summit is on the 14th of October. Um, we have tickets for sale. We have free places for teachers and government and educators, um, and it's streamed live on Facebook. So if you can't make it, you can join and, and see um, and watch the entire summit. Um, it's urgent this situation, it's really urgent because we know what works. We now have free tools being developed to help support dyslexic children. Microsoft have phenomenal things on, with learning tools and uh, to, to help with access arrangements and to support children in the classroom. And we've created our free training and we're going to be doing much, much more. But it's important because these kids that we're currently labeling as disabled and ignoring and trying not to identify are the very people that the workforce is looking for. They have all the skills that the workforce needs. So we have to act now. And um, at the summit, you'll see we're stepping up the urgency and we're putting together some new campaigns to actually build an army of people around the world, like me, passionate mum, who was so incensed by what happened to my kids. I've met lots of you in the room who are exactly the same as me. Um, and with all of that, you know, we all vote. So governments are going to listen to us if we're saying, actually, our school doesn't have anybody trained and they're not picking up dyslexia. So it's time to kind of create that movement and, and really move the issue forward. So 
I also think that Gibraltar is in a really unique position because you're a small country, you have some hugely passionate people behind this. There's a huge amount of influence just in this room today and the people who've, who've turned up because they're passionate about it. We'd love to work with you to, to help you to, to get dyslexia right in Gibraltar. And I think it would be a very easy thing for you to do because you're small and you can get straight to the decision makers. Probably a lot easier than the hoops that we're having to go through with our politics at the moment, but that's probably best not spoken about. Um, I'd just like to end now by playing you the highlights film from the summit last year, and I really would encourage you all to, to join us online or, or come in person. It's at the Science Museum, and it's going to be absolutely amazing. So today was the first ever Global Dyslexia Summit. We brought together people from around 20 countries from around the world in the audience with people viewing on Facebook Live from absolutely everywhere. This evening's about trying to break down prejudices that somehow dyslexia means people aren't as bright as others or can't do as well as others. And it was really to highlight the fact that dyslexia is a different way of thinking and a brilliant way of thinking and to start the movement towards change. My name's Matt Hancock. I'm proud to be the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, a member of the Cabinet in the UK and made by dyslexia. <laughs> the world needs more people to think like we dyslexics do. Our creativity, our intuition, our emotional and social intelligence, our ability to think laterally and imaginatively, our visualisation, our reasoning, these are exactly the skills and the strengths that dyslexics have in abundance. The EY report is showing us very clearly that dyslexic people have a huge value to the world. Three years ago, we made some significant changes to our recruitment process to make sure that we were bringing into the organisation people that had dyslexic strengths. And even so far, we can tell he's made a big difference. I was sitting in meetings with an extraordinary range of different ways of thinking, trying to do the impossible things and trying to guess the future in technology. And uh, the value of dyslexics uh, and other neurodiverse groups was absolutely uh, critical to the mission. As headhunters and as recruiters, and provider of talent to business, we have to look at the whole skill set. It should be agile thinking that we're looking for as opposed to the standard, what is someone's literacy? You shouldn't be using that anymore. Look at the report. There are three recommendations that we make. Um, two of those I, I could sum up as um, move to a strengths-based culture where you talk up what people are able to do, not point out the flaws they have then also creating a, an environment, a broader environment, where we have the language and inclusive with our other colleagues so we can all work together on this agenda. We do need the corporate sector to speak up. We really do, and everybody has to become an ambassador and force change. Some of the most creative people I know are dyslexic, and it's made me stop and think about how I work, how BAFTA works as a company, and how having all sorts of people is incredibly important to any company, no matter what you do. The highlight for me today is believing that actually such a diverse community is interested in discussing the future of the way that we work and how we need diverse minds in order to create that future. Well, I think it was pretty obvious something was up. And, and, and luckily, luckily my mother spotted it quite early. So I'm, well, I'm, I, I call myself a lucky dyslexic. I didn't actually realise I was dyslexic until I went to a toast party dressed as a goat. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing to actually speak to other people and see how many similarities there are. But listening to Nick up there and he was saying about how he he reads a long email, just switches off. I'm exactly the same. It's just sharing and exchanging ideas. Uh, people are recommending books for my daughter. It's just a, sort of a, a hubbub of activity. I wasn't tested for dyslexia until I was in my 20s. I want more children to understand that it's an absolutely brilliant tool. It's about opportunity. It's about having your own special superpower. It's about thinking differently. I'm truly delighted to be here with you to discuss the work uh, that the Department of Education is doing to support people with
dyslexia. To be able to have children feel like, yeah, I can do that. We are not doing the right things in our schools, and it's not just in the UK. We have to change the way we're measuring children. Some of the challenges at school, especially during GCSE, was probably writing essays under these pressurising like time conditions. We have to get over this, this very antiquated mm. way of benchmarking children. We are very keen in Ofsted that um, children that have specific learning difficulties are identified as soon as possible so that the support can be put in so that they don't have to struggle. The brilliant work being done by Made by Dyslexia just excited us so much that we wanted to get involved. We made the pledge to support the Made by Dyslexia uh, initiative and to ensure that the right tools and technology get to the 700 million people with dyslexia. The pledge is to provide training materials for teachers and parents to help identify dyslexia early on and to help the kids overcome dyslexia. We're planning to launch in early 2019 and uh, make them freely available on our Microsoft Educator community. It's time for us to say to the world, we want to be called dyslexic, so please, wherever you are, say dyslexia, because it's really, really important to us. We want to be identified early. We don't want to be left to fail at school. We want you to acknowledge that you need to think differently about dyslexia, and you need to start taking the steps towards helping dyslexic children to reach their potential. Thank you. So there you go. Be part of the movement. Please follow us on social media. Um, I always have to say that or I get told off. Um, but it would be fantastic to, to work with you guys in Gibraltar. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much, Stuart and team, for, for organizing it, MFIT, EY, and every, all the other amazing sponsors. So thank you very much. And that was Kate Griggs, founder and uh, CEO of Made by Dyslexia. Thank you very much for sharing your personal insights, experience, and um, personal story with us. Thank you very much. Um, a reminder, you can continue to uh, submit those questions to us, and you can do so on our 540-77511, 540-77511, and you can text or WhatsApp your messages to us. We'll be um, addressing those at the end of this morning's session. Now, um, also a reminder, uh, the Dyslexia Support Group are online, and you can find all their details as well in your program. And still to come this morning, Ben Cook, he's a senior strategy consultant at EY, and he's going to be telling us all about the value of dyslexia. But that'll be after a short break. We're going to take a coffee break now. We invite you to go into the patio, grab a, a coffee, and we'd like uh, to kindly ask you to try and be seated in the next 25 minutes or so. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, before we delve into part two, a little reminder, if you, so, if you could so kindly put your mobiles on silent, um, but keep them handy, because uh, remember, we're still waiting on your questions. We're going to have a, a question and answer session at the end of this morning, and we look forward to receiving your questions. And remember, you can find them in your programs. The number to text or WhatsApp is 540-77511, and that's in your programs. Um, we're gonna, we've heard two brilliant stories two insights this morning. We are yet to hear a third, and um, that's from Ben Cook, who's going to be talking to us about the value of dyslexia. Now, EYN Made by Dyslexia have been working very hard on a report analyzing the characteristics, the characteristics of dyslexia and also working to work on the positives of dyslexia. Ben's going to be talking to us about that in the next few minutes, but first, here's a little video preview, the value of dyslexia. Made by Dyslexia's aim is to highlight the positive side of dyslexia, the strengths that are associated with dyslexia. We're aware that there are issues in education and how education is focusing on the deficit and the difficulties. But that's also the case in the workforce where people are more focused on the things that dyslexics can't do than they are focused on the things that they can. So we wanted to change that with, with some research and with some evidence that actually really looked at the positives and the strengths. It was very easy to get involved in the value of dyslexia report for two reasons. Um, First one is uh, my job at EY is to make sure we build the most high-performance company ever and therefore making sure that we know how to work with our dyslexic individuals and take advantage of their strengths is incredibly important to me and the rest of the organisation. 
The second is our purpose at EY is building a better working world. Um, how better to get involved with that than to make sure that we contribute to the work that Made by Dyslexia is doing and is needed in the rest of society. EY took the dyslexic thinking skills framework and mapped them across the World Economic Forum skills of the future. They looked at the six skills that dyslexics tend to have, visualising, imagining, communicating, exploring, connecting and reasoning. We found that dyslexic strengths align to core work-related skills and abilities of the future. There is a demand for a different type of skill set. The speed of change in the world and the, the skills that people are looking for in the, in the, in the new world or the, the, during the fourth industrial revolution are different to, to say, skills that have been looked for in the past. And dyslexics match very well with that future state. A common trait amongst dyslexic individuals is that they usually have big picture thinking, the ability to see things a bit differently and to think differently, approach problems and solutions differently. It can really actually bring a better solution to a complex problem. Globalisation is upon us. The te technological solutions and advancements are completely changing how we interact with each other, which essentially means that at work now we're working across boundaries, across borders, not just across offices. So we need to have types of people who are comfortable with that level of change. And dyslexic individuals specifically are very comfortable with moving and shifting. The people aspect of our business is very important in a changing environment and dyslexics are essential, I think, to that change and that innovation and the creativity. The ability and the confidence to be able to, be able to go talk to someone is really important. And dyslexics naturally have this ability to manage upwards and to communicate effectively with people. So if you're an organisation that needs big problem-solving skills, needs creativity, needs individuals that can do detail, but then step back and see a vision, well then I think dyslexic individuals have something to offer to your organisation. 70% of people who are dyslexic hide their dyslexia from their employers, which is crazy because we know that dyslexia has this incredible pattern of strengths. And if they can open up and tell their employers that they're dyslexic, then we can focus on those strengths and also give the support to the challenges as well. I know in our organisation we try and lean in and step forward and make sure that people feel comfortable about talking about who they are. We have a phrase which is, runs really deep in our culture, which is bring all of you to work. We want people to have a high belonging here because under that atmosphere, I think they contribute the best. It really is about having that conversation about understanding what dyslexia is for that individual. And firstly, how can we help them, enable them at work? And secondly, where can we target these strengths? If today we were to employ Superwoman, what we wouldn't do is complain that she can't handle kryptonite. We'd look at how good she is and all the wonderful other things she does, but we'd never, never really draw attention to that kryptonite's not her thing. Surely that's a job that all of us have to do with our dyslexic colleagues. It is the responsibility of employers to create inclusive environments, but it's also, I think, the responsibility of individuals to really find where you fit. And being dyslexic is all about that. It's all about finding that right place for you and not trying to fit in to places that aren't ready for you. At why we made the bold move three years ago to radically change the way we look to the criteria for which people apply to our organisation. And actually, we were really keen to create a level playing field. So we removed things like academic criteria, the schools or universities you went through, the jobs or responsibility on the internships you might have, to make sure that we cast our net as wide as possible before you embark upon your assessment with us. Particularly from my experience at school, I did not, I would not have the grades to be able to, from GCSE and A-levels, to work with, you know, within a big four. So without EY's um, hiring processes, I wouldn't be in this seat today. I think the first thing I would say to other businesses is, is read the report and get engaged with Made by Dyslexia. I think that's a great starting point. Uh, and one of the th missions that we're on is to make sure that other organisations understand if you can be more inclusive about how you look at talent, actually, you end up with a stronger organisation. We've had the most incredible response to the value of Dyslexia Report. People have been reading it across the globe, taking it into their employers, taking it into their schools, and shouting about the value of dyslexia, which is exactly what we wanted to achieve. We're really excited for the next steps and actually making sure this message gets to absolutely everybody, but also the next report that we're working on with EY right now. Now, um, he played a big 
part in the making of the value of dyslexia report, a report which, amongst many things, also uh, highlights um, the, vital, the crucial role that uh, dyslexia will play in our future. With us this morning is Benjamin Cook, Senior Strategy Consultant at EWA. He'll be telling more about us. Well, hello. Hello. So happy to be here today. His Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to be able to present to you today the value of dyslexia, dyslexic strengths, and a changing world of work. And I'm really happy to be here today to support the Gibraltar Dyslexia Support Group, particularly at this seminar. So, as I've said, and as we've talked about throughout this engagement so far, the Valley Dyslexia Report is a collaboration between EY and me by Dyslexia. But before I get into this, I thought I'd introduce myself very briefly. So, as, as mentioned, I'm a Senior Constra Strategy Consultant at EY uh, Advisory London. But what does that kind of actually mean? As a dyslexic individual, as I'm proudly dyslexic, I work with some of the leading organizations as a spearhead uh, to understand their complex problems. I specifically on my team um, am welcomed uh, for my different perspective that I bring uh, to my clients uh, and, to, and to my team in the overall outputs. So even more important than that, I'm able to talk openly about not only my dyslexia, but most importantly, how this is extremely applicable to the type of work that I do. Another thing that I'm also really keen on is to make sure that we build a community. Uh, I'm also uh, EY UK Dyslexic Community Chair. So what that essentially means is, uh, at EY UK, we have a broad community of dyslexic individuals that exist across all of our business. And I coordinate to make sure that we have uh, the correct support, particularly for the challenges that can come with dyslexia, but also to make sure that we're really pushing the message to make people understand what dyslexia is in the workplace. And finally, I was the lead contributor uh, to the Valid Dyslexia Report. And Yes, it is me sitting in a room with a team figuring out how we can do this, and I'm super excited to be here today to stand behind with, with EY to present this piece of work. So today I'm going to talk to my kind of understanding of dyslexia, and I actually want to test and challenge in the room your perceptions of dyslexia. What I really want to do is to contextualize and visualize what dyslexia is. I feel that people kind of, we talk about, we kind of understand it, but when people show up to work, it can often be quite ambiguous. It can often be something for managers who haven't experienced dyslexia before, something that can be quite intimidating because for them, they haven't actually been exposed to this type of diversity and inclusiveness before. So I'm going to walk through and kind of show you what this looks like and what it really feels like uh, from an analytical perspective. I'm then going to take you through the method and approach uh, I took for the report uh, and built with uh, a diverse team. And finally, I'm going to give you guys some recommendations for businesses and also to managers. There's so some things that you should be thinking about, uh, but some things you can start doing right now that can bring some great value. So, what is dyslexia? We've seen a few definitions about what it is today, and this is the definition that we use in the report. So, we know that dyslexia influences at least 1 in 10 people, and it can be up to 20% of those who have been diagnosed. It's a genetic difference in the individual's ability to learn and process information. Importantly about this definition, as a result, dyslexic individuals have differing abilities with strengths in creative problem solving and communication skills, and challenges with spelling, reading, and memorizing facts. And generally, a dyslexic cognitive profile, and that means the types of skills a dyslexic individual will have, will be uneven when compared to a neurotypical cognitive, pro cognitive profile. So, very quickly about neurodiversity. There are neurotypical individuals, those who are considered to be cognitively normal, should we say, and those who are neurodivergent, those who have a different neurocognitive functioning, such as dyslexia. So what we're actually recognizing is that there are two different groups and two different types of skill sets, which is firstly a really important thing. And dyslexia it plays an extremely important part as part of this conversation. But it really means that dyslexic individuals really do think differently. But what does this actually look like? It feels, and for me, it's felt intangible for a very long time. Um, and I guess it took me a trip back to when I did my original diagnostic assessment before I did my um, postgrad. I had to go and do this again because I knew, as a dyslexic individual, it's important that you speak about these things. It's important that you recognize those challenges and support that you understand where you might need help. And what I did is I went back and looked at my assessment results and I actually found some things that were quite interesting. So I'm going to walk with you. From an analytical perspective, which is what I do, <laughs> um, my visual story comparative to, for example, someone else who isn't dyslexic. 
So before everyone gets a bit crazy that it's a bar chart and we're not at work, <laughs> um, there are a few things I don't want you to focus on. I don't want you to focus on the score on the left-hand side. I don't want you to focus on the tests at the bottom. What I want you to focus on are the yellow bars and the gray average range, 85 to 115 area. So what this is showing is basically a range of tests that a dyslexic individual will be tested against when they go and have their assessment. And this varies between different organizations, but primarily it looks at understanding and testing different types of memory and spatial abilities. So along here, what I've represented is what a neurotypical, that's be someone who is cognitively normal, should we say, would take these tests. And this is a representation of individuals who perhaps go through school, they achieve high grades, they come through work, and everything, you know, they have a bit of struggle, but everything seems relatively fine. And what I wanted to show here is you know, the potential ability of 80% of or 90% of our workforce existing within this area. And that's, that's fantastic. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. But what I want to show you now is a dyslexic cognitive profile. And what I want you all to do in the room is just to take a moment and reflect on the differences between these two. And I'll just flick that between the first and second before I explain. So now we can see that there's a difference. So this isn't something that, you know, someone comes up and says, I'm dyslexic, this is my problem, this is it. This is actually some analytics that shows us that there is a significant difference in how potentially two people could work. And there are two things I want you to focus on for this part of the presentation. The parts below the average range score and the part above the average range score. Dyslexia is commonly known for its challenges, but is this the whole picture? So for me personally, this is my story of dyslexia. I had a lot of problems at school, I had a lot of problems with exams. Um, I fun fundamentally found it extremely difficult to come through the general education system. For a lot of help and support, I was able to. But primarily, what I didn't recognize throughout my whole school years and throughout most of my working years is that I had actually a special ability. My ability to visualize, my ability to really understand what spatial awareness means, and my ability to put and to build the big picture. I'd done these things without even realizing it. And when I look back at this test result, I realized that actually when I was doing my master's degree, that the focus was solely on me getting through the exam and focusing on the challenges. But what I really didn't understand was actually what I could bring and what as an individual, comparative to someone else, made me stand out. So what I wanted to do by showing you these two is to really contextualize and to make everyone, for example, who might not have experienced dyslexia, just to really reflect on themselves about their own differences, their own strengths and their challenges, but also those around you who you might think are exceptional at certain things and how you actually might even consider praising them or using them for those areas. What I want to do now is to really explore and to understand what... Let's go to work, there it is this green bar actually means when we show up to work. What it really means for employers and what it really means for managers when they're on your team. So, the value of dyslexia, dyslexic strengths and the changing world of work. What do we do? We took and understood dyslexic skills, that being that green bar, and we mapped them with future demand, future, uh, demand skills to determine dyslexic strengths at work. The second thing that we did is we wanted to understand, particularly from the test that you just looked at, what would be inhibiting, particularly in education and employment, us from understanding and achieving this relative benefit above the average. So we conducted a range of interviews with dyslexic individuals at school, college, university, and work to find consistent themes along these areas and to find pressure points, areas that we could provide recommendations to individuals in order to capture these strengths. And finally, we used our recommendations from our understanding of what dyslexia is, the mapping of in-demand skills, the personas that we created to come up with real recommendations that can start that conversation to moving forward. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through the methodology relatively quickly because it's quite heavy. Um, I'm going to focus at the end on the recommendations. If there's any more questions regarding the report, you're more than welcome um, to reach out to Nathan at EY. I'm happy to do the office or Stuart to share the report. I'm happy to talk and answer more questions on that. The first part of what we did, as Kate has mentioned, we used the Made by Dyslexia framework. So really important, communicating, imagining, visualizing, exploring, connecting, and reasoning. 
this is the green bar that we're talking about. These are the hard skills that when people show up who are dyslexic and a bit different, bring to the work, world of work. And on the right-hand side, we have the World Economic Forum, Future of Jobs, basically skills. So these are the types of skills that World Economic Forum have noticed as being in demand for the future. And what we essentially said was, how could two things that we know, one, that there is a specific skill set that we are looking at and that we might need, and two, we understand what the relative demand is across all industries. So how do these two things fit together, and what did we find? Well, what we found is that dyslexic strengths align to core work-related skills and abilities of the future. Dyslexic individuals, specifically, have a range of skills, in-demand skills, that organizations can tap. Firstly, existing across strong, very strong, and exceptional. So what we did here is, by definition, so association of definitions of both the MVD framework and also the World Forum, came up with something where businesses can actually start categorizing and understanding from a jobs perspective really what it means when someone shows up to work. And this is the result. And not only does it, I think, replicate with the types of speakers that we've had today about team working, about different scenarios, different types of people, but also about how there is a specific area, particularly within dyslexia, that could be absolutely capitalized on by organizations that can actually also bring up you know, dyslexic individuals from what is an association of challenges to a relative conversation of strengths. So extremely important, I think, to put this um, and to have this knowledge and to understand it. But then, obviously, if people are coming to work who are dyslexic like this, but we don't understand dyslexia, we don't understand how to find these strengths, what could be stopping us from achieving these things? And why is the conversation primarily occurred around challenges? So the second part of this presentation looks at personas. So what we did here is we wanted to understand a range of experiences, as mentioned. We interviewed about 30 to 40 people across a school and employment. And what we did was, instead of kind of culminating and individually commenting, we uh, aggregated consistent um, interviews into four succinct personas with all different experiences and backgrounds. Because dyslexia is not about an individual. Every individual is, is different and it must be recognized. So, for example, Chris, um, he for himself, he didn't find that actually dyslexia influenced him in, in his own way. He found that actually he was able to get through it. Secondly, Michelle, she had a real difficulty with dyslexia. She felt it was a curse. Thirdly, Shreya had her difficulties, but the right support, she was able to get help from her colleagues. And finally, Tom, he faced challenges but when he was younger, but now it's a superpower. And for every dyslexic in the room, we'll have their own individual story, and it's very personal to them. So what we really wanted to do with this report was to not only show that, yes, there are some hard skills, and this is the point, but we really need to connect and understand people's journey and story better for us to be able to access these points. So what we did, and this is at a high level, so this does get a bit more detailed, is we mapped a journey. And forgive me that it's a bit small, but what we did is we essentially mapped along this journey where this individual had specific areas where they thought they did really well and where areas they thought they did not so well. So particularly from Tom's example, he had huge issues with spelling reading at school, but actually a dyslexia assessment enabled him to find his challenges and strengths. And a key important part of dyslexia is recognizing and understanding that. But eventually what he found was, from his own personal experience, that he was placed in a job where, his ch where it focused on his challenges and he wasn't able to actually be himself. He ended up leaving, he started his own business, um, particularly with coding and hackathons. And for him personally, his dyslexia and his ability to notice where he didn't feel felt like he fit in and to move forward to something where he could use his strengths enabled him to recognize his own abilities as a superpower. What we also did is we understood and took the types of different you know, dyslexic skills that existed across this individual persona. So at the top, we just have a range of coloring of these different skills associated with the made by dyslexia framework. So just as important as we understand and recognize the types of skills that we need, we must also recognize and understand and engage with people about their story, about how it works and what's worked for them. And particularly from this experience, we can really start to engage and actually understand you know, from, from an individual perspective how we can help that person and support them at work. And what I'd like to show now is some recommendations based off of this research that we've done um, for businesses and also for managers. So what we recommended from the report are three primary things. And as Steve Varley mentioned in the video, firstly, embrace a strength-based culture. So what does this mean? Committed leadership is extremely important in this. A key figurehead who is championing diversity primarily, but you know, dyslexic differences in the workplace is key to make sure that there is a confidence level within the organization, however big, however small, about 
these, these uh, positive and you know, relative differences, but also that there needs to be a psychologically supportive environment. So what does that mean? It essentially means that you should be able to work in an environment where you can make mistakes, you can learn, and you can grow with people. That is essentially what employment is about. Um, we need to make sure that there are you know, environments where people are actively talking and understanding different challenges and abilities, but recognizing that actually work is also about learning. Work is also about accepting and, and failing and coming back up. There is no job that doesn't do that. For dyslexic individuals specifically, this can be a bit of a challenge associated with previous experience. So again, relative to the types of personal experiences we talked about, we very much need to make sure that there is a real conversation around that happening. And it starts with that leadership strategy. Secondly, we believe that democratization um, of access to dyslexia screeners and assessments and information resources to be extremely important in this. Where people feel like they can't talk about it, they need to be able to have and to look at resources, to be able to understand themselves before they can open up and really start talking about it. So we believe this to be really important, particularly in education. Um, if, if you are dyslexic and you haven't had a set and you think you're dyslexic, it's incredibly important to have a screening test and to try and get an assessment because you know, it's, the buck essentially stops with you. You know, no one, when you go into the exam room, it doesn't matter how, you know, the effort you put in before, you know, unless you have understood and targeted areas and had that conversation, it can, it can you know, affect you later in life. So we have to make sure that the people are confident in understanding dyslexia. We have to make sure that these tests and screeners are available for people so they can really understand relatively to where they sit and what they can do about it proactively. And thirdly, what we wanted to do is to really understand more broadly how different minds could fit in to the wider organizational image. You know, as part of neurodiversity, diversity, inclusiveness, we're all aware of the benefits different types of diversity can bring to an organization. Firstly, we started to look at understanding, you know, building a capability. So when we talk about the types of strengths that I just recognized, particularly of the exceptional, very strong or strong, how do these fit in with your business objectives? So it's a time to really start thinking about the types of skills that you need in your business and how you're going to start using them. Secondly, we wanted to target performance. So how are you supporting challenges within the workplace based on the experience-based conversations that you're having? And where are you targeting these strengths? Are you being you know, emotionally intelligent to understand and to take the time to think about where people fit within certain roles and to not generalize? Thirdly, to drive motivation. We want to mo motivate and empower dyslexic individuals. So for this, this is really important. Uh, we want to make sure that dyslexic individuals really do feel like they can change the world and to make sure they fit within the, wor the working world. And enhance efficiencies. We want to make sure that managers can understand and optimize dyslexic performance. It's incredibly important that we continue this conversation. So finally, for managers on the ground right now. So you know, this is uh, a very... It can be a bit of a touch and go topic because some people haven't experienced it before. Some people don't know what to do. And that's actually fine. If you haven't experienced this next year in the workplace, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. All you have to do is essentially start that conversation. And that's from a dyslexic individual in the workplace and the manager relative to their service line. You need to make sure you have introductory conversations and more about members in your team and engage with them about these differences. Uh, the bigger chance there is to disclose dyslexia at an earlier stage, the better. It means that you can have these open conversations and you can sort it and figure it out earlier. Secondly, request to actually see an individual's cognitive profile. Now, I would say that this is a really quite a personal conversation. So, you know, on a sensitive level, you know, if, if they want to show you, then it's fantastic because you can then work through these test results and actually start thinking about how you can work and support both each other on the job. Secondly, is uh, to regularly communicate, to so continuously engage with the individual, to check on progress and if challenges are being mitigated and strengths focused. Weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, wh whatever works, whatever touch points needed, make sure they're happening. Thirdly, create and speak to supportive networks such as the one that we're here today to, for, for assistance with training and guidance. Utilize these networks within the business to seek advice. And particularly with the types of, you know, today we're all here representing dyslexia more broadly, but EY, and you know, the other partners within Gibraltar, we are working collectively and together to try and figure out the best way to support this next year at the world of work and to continue on this train that we're working on, which is to create knowledge, insight into the management of this year in the workplace. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much. Ben Cook, thank you very much for that. I'm actually going to ask you to stay on the stage now. We're going to move on to the last segment. And I'm also going to call back on stage uh, Kate Craig. Um, and I'm also going to invite up on stage a uh, local businesswoman, Brenda Kuby. Can't see you, Brenda. You could make your way to the stage. 
And also, we still haven't heard from him. Um, he's the chair of the local dyslexic support group. Um, and we could invite us to stage Stuart Byrne as well, please. I could ask you all to take a seat. And we're now going to be moving on to the last segment of the morning. And for those of you who know me and know what I do, now I'm in my comfort zone. Interesting people, interesting stories, and a sofa. <laughs> okay. We're still waiting uh, for your questions. Um, we received quite a few. And remember, you can still um, email, well, not email, WhatsApp and text those messages to us, 540-77511. And our panel will be taking those questions from you. Um, let's go through, through some of those questions. First time I'm looking at them, just bear with. Okay, an interesting first question. Um, what would you say to businesses who want to make their business dyslexia friendly? Who wants to take that? Hello, is this on? There we go. Um, so as, as I, you know, I think, there are two things you need to understand. And it's, it's, it's really about starting that conversation. Um, this is you know, early days. We're, we're, you know, as EY and as our wider partners, we are all working together to figure out the best ways to manage particularly challenges and strengths within, within the business. But it has to start with the conversation, the dyslexic individual recognizing and feeling confident that they can talk about basically their differences, and the managers creating that psychologically supportive environment that enables them to go and talk to them about it. You'd be surprised what can happen just by having a conversation with someone about where they think they're best and where they think they might not be so good. Um, I think this is the first stage to any form of kind of you know, driving of business value in the future. The second thing, which is actually what we're working on right now, is to understand primarily from dyslexia from a skills basis. You know, firstly, what skills do you need in the workplace? You know, this is changing rapidly. This is not something that's you know, occurring in staged approaches, and it's, it's, it's rapid. The types of skills and abilities are changing alongside technological influences. So you need to actually, from a business perspective, understand the types of skills you'll need now and also in the future. The second thing is you also need to understand, and particularly from the recruitment process, what actually are the skills that you have in your organization and what skills from dyslexia are coming and how can you align them. Again, it's about creating and using support networks like this to make sure that we're in the conversation, you're involved in it, and to make sure that you're having the conversation more generally in the business and creating a diverse and inclusive environment. So in the short term, make sure you're having those conversations now. Don't, you know, don't wait, have them. And, and secondly, in the future, start really considering how and what skills mean for your business. If anyway, I may, um, today's world, everything costs a lot of money. In your work, in your experience, how willing, um, how open, um, do you find employers um, to actually make those necessary changes which you've spoken to us about this morning? That's, that's a really good point. And actually, these, these changes relative to themselves um, don't, don't cost anything, to be honest. At the moment, the conversation is the important thing. Um, we can talk, there are obviously adjustments, you know, my, my specific expertise is with employment, you know, I can't speak for education systems, but what I can say is that when you show up to work, you need to basically make sure that this conversation happens, you know, we have also, you know, understanding of different types of supporting technologies which can help, and aligned to local laws, you can get these basically applied to you, so if you have a dyslexia assessment, and you believe that you need some help at work um, through supportive technology or things like that, you can actively go and get these, and this is, this is the letter of the law, so this is something that you can get support with. So these are things that you can get right now that can really kind of help individuals do that. But businesses more broadly, again, it's about creating that diverse, inclusive culture. It's about having the conversations, working with partners to really understand, are we creating the right environment? Um, now, we've got quite a few questions. We promise we're going to try our best to get through most of them. Those that go unanswered this morning, be assured that um, you know, Stuart will get to them during the course of the day, no doubt. Um, let's uh, vary it up a bit. Um, Brenda, I think one for you. Um, you're well known as a businesswoman locally, and you're very well known for your work, but you're also the mother of a dyslexic child. Um, and we have a question here. Um, what is it like to have a child who has dyslexia? Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure, actually, because it is a challenge. Um, especially when you've got to fight for um, what we would consider basic rights. Um, you know, um, education-wise, um, it's always a fight to ensure that they get the um, sort of what, what we feel they should be having. You know, it's basic rights of access, you know, breaking it down. Um, you know, you're constantly looking at how to support them so that they have... You know, that their self-esteem, I think Kate touched on it, 
um, briefly earlier about, you know, you can have a child that you've built up, that you've, you've embraced, that they've, they're learning about, you know, what their dyslexia is, um, and then it can be demolished with other people not understanding um, what it is. And, you know, and you can go around and you can be talking about it, you can ex be explaining to family and friends, the schools, you know, their employers, all of those things. But, you know, sometimes it's, it's a lonely battle, um, which is why having associations like the Gibraltar Dyslexic Support Group, they're there to actually help support parents. You know, because sometimes if, if you're not aware, if you're not dyslexic yourself, you're not aware of what um, they're actually going through. So having support there, having other parents, having people that you can talk to, that you can vent your frustrations, is you know very helpful but you know in my experience of having um, a dyslexic child is one that it gives you joy because they see things so differently they see things in a way that you can't see it and to actually work with that joy is a, for me is a pleasure okay i'm going to try and take a few questions that are interconnected um someone's asking here um an interesting one. We've spoken about the benefits of dyslexia. Um, so perhaps uh, you want to go into um, explaining this one to us. Um, what are some of the signs, parents, what are the signs parents um, should be looking out for to identify um, dyslexia in their child? Um, I think there was some mentioned in some of the videos before, um, but things like uh, delayed speech in, in a child, you know, if normally children are speaking by year one, um, that can be a sign of dyslexia. Um, they also sometimes struggle to find a dominant hand with writing. So if you see a child that's uh, struggling to find a dominant hand, that's also a sign. When, when parents call me, I normally say, look and see if there's a history of dyslexia within the family. That is a massive sign. If there is a history of dyslexia and you suspect it's dyslexia, the likelihood is it is. Um, so if there is a history, that is a, a massive sign. Dyslexia is very hereditary. Um, so it's, it's something to look out for. A lot of parents don't actually know that they're dyslexic or maybe know that a family member may be dyslexic. So you may, I may ask them, um, do you have dyslexia in the family? And they say, no, 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 we don't. So then I, 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 I go for maybe a series of questions and maybe ask questions like, do you have any uncles, aunties or, or family members who maybe have struggled in school but are very creative or have gone into the arts, or um, maybe are entrepreneurs, or something that is very, very common for dyslexics is um, to do a degree later on in life. So we find that with, with dyslexic people, they struggle at school, they just get a, a job, and they go on, and then when they're a little bit older, they really realize, well, actually, their self-esteem is built up a bit, they're a bit older, a bit more mature, and they, they, they tend to do degrees later on in life. So there's lots of signs that you can see in a family, in a pattern in a family, that maybe they haven't been diagnosed, but they're signs of dyslexia in a family. So that's what I, I would tell to parents. So then if you see that kind of patterns, those kind of patterns in the family, and you think there's dyslexia in the family, and then you think your child is dyslexic, well, obviously there's a big, a big chance that it is. Then what I would say is, is educate yourself. Educate yourself on dyslexia as much as you possibly can. The more you know, the more you'll be able to see if your child is dyslexic. So there's lots of resources online. I mean, we're really lucky. When, when my mom, one of the founders of the Dyslexia Support Group, started, they didn't have the internet. You know, you had to go to libraries, you had to order books. Nowadays, you can just go onto YouTube and you can watch a video and learn a lot very quickly. Thanks to, you know, groups like Made by Dyslexia, who have got really good videos, one that I, I often recommend, Susan Barton, if you just go to the Gibraltar Dyslexia Support Group YouTube page, we've got highly recommended videos there. You know, after an hour um, watching a few of these videos, you would be able to say yes or no. Obviously, it's not a definitive answer that you can take to, to an exam, but it's an, an answer that you can give yourself. If you're watching that and you're saying, oh, that's my child, that's my child, that's my child, you'll know by the end of it. If, it, if that is when they describe dyslexia, if that is your child that they're describing. 
So there's lots of little things that you can do, and it's, it's quite easy. Obviously, then the formal side of things would be going to speak to, to the schools, depending on the age, obviously, of the, of, the, of the child, but then going to speak to the form tutor, the SENCOs, um, and just voicing um, your concern. And, and normally, what I s suggest is back that up with your understanding. So like I said, the more you understand, the more you know about dyslexia, when you go to the schools, you can articulate um, that you think it's dyslexia because you have the knowledge behind it. Now, Stuart, um, you mentioned your mother there, interestingly. Um, people who know you um, know that your personal story has played a very important role in heightening awareness to dyslexia locally here in Gibraltar. Your story has been chronicled by public television, by GBC since you were a boy. And when your mother took those first steps um, to draw attention to the issue of dyslexia, at a time when uh, officials even said um, dyslexia didn't exist, um, she since launched the support group, which you've taken over now. How have attitudes changed in Gibraltar across the decades? And um, what improvements, if any, um, have come about um, as a result of your tireless work and effort? Well, I have to say thank you to all those who started the Dyslexia Support Group in Gibraltar. I, mean, I think it's over 20 years now. Um, and all the work they've put in over the years, I think that has helped a great deal to to form a good relationship with the government, with the education department, um, and things have moved along. I wouldn't be sitting here if I, think, I thought they had moved along enough. I mean, 20 years have gone by, and I think that not enough has been done. The change has not been as drastic as the time has been. So there's still a lot to do, but um, especially you asked the Dyslexic Support Group, and we've got a very good relationship with the education department, and we work side by side with them with a lot of things and, and we appreciate their support and their help and um, uh, we, we, work, we carry on working with them. But I think like today is also not just about the education department and accessing the youngsters and the kids who are in our schools who may not know they're dyslexic, but it's also to reach out and touch those people in, in the business community who... Um, may have gone through school not knowing they're dyslexic. You may be even sitting there right now thinking, actually, I'm dyslexic, and you've never known it. So that is also a, a very important part of what we do, is just try to build awareness up to everybody, not just the kids in the education department. It's also the government, it's also you know, the workplace. The workplace is where all our kids end up eventually, so it's important that the workplace is also a dyslexia-friendly area. Now, Kate, one for you, if I may. Um, dyslexia has been legally recognized as a disability in Ireland, a word we haven't heard mentioned this morning. Um, is this a positive or is it quite the contrary? Um, when I realized that dyslexia was considered a disability, I was really shocked, I have to be honest, because that was not my experience. Um, it, gives, it gives people rights. It enables you to access support. Um, Personally, I don't think it's a helpful um, a term because I think it, it, it then casts around, it, we just look at the negative. So I personally don't think it's a disability. I don't think it should be a disability, but I do understand why it's there because it does enable people to access support. Um, I think, as you've seen from the presentation today, this is about us having a real shift in how we perceive dyslexia. Um, and to really get everybody to understand the value of it. Because for too many years, it's, it's something people are embarrassed about because of all the negative connotations. And it's being swept under the carpet. People, people are not being identified. People are not talking about it, even if they are. So um, we just think the disability label needs to kind of be rethought because it's, it's in essence, dragging it down. So, um, but yes, I understand why it's there. Um, another one, if I may. Um, someone's asking, specifically made by dyslexia, are you working with universities so that they could incorporate a module in identifying and teaching children with dyslexia in the teaching training courses, courses offered? So, yes, obviously, we need to get something into teacher training. Um, it's quite difficult to do anything on a blanket basis. Um, we are uh, lobbying government very hard in the UK. Um, it's a little bit difficult with our political climate to, to, we were making a lot of traction and then things have changed, so we're sort of starting not from scratch, but it's just a, a hard um, environment to work in. Um, but 
Honestly, we believe that this is, this is about reaching the people because if we can, and that's why so much of what we're doing is around this whole culture change and, and the big communications campaigns, because people go into teaching because they're passionate about empowering kids. So if they understand that they need to know about dyslexia, then that's going to help to drive the change as much as us talking to colleges and universities, which we are too. Also got a question here from someone who works in recruitment um, saying their applications range from highly specialized posts to very large general vacancies where the only entry requirements requested are academic qualifications and then entry exams. What steps could we take to minimize the possibility of someone who may not have done well in school due to dyslexia not meeting these requirements and being excluded? Hmm? That's, that's a really, really good question, it's, and it's a tough one because we just discussed that this change takes time, and you know we are stuck in a traditional way of, of working, of understanding, particularly what you know, uh, particularly from school um, and universities, what I guess was a previous view of what success could only be. Um, so I think just maybe like we're doing at EY, um, we're recognising and testing different things. So particularly removing grade criteria boundaries. Um, for individuals, so my experience of this is that I wouldn't have um, the A levels to get into EY, but because they removed that, but also it tested me along different areas, such as how I work with people. So an example is we had a working group session whereby we had a problem we had to solve together. Um, we all sat there and we all you know work well relative to our strengths and our team to figure out a problem because that's what work is, right? It's not about what grade I got, it's about what can I do in the room. And usually as a dyslexic person, I'm very good with people and I can do a lot in the room. So it, it was a great place for me to be able to show what I can do. Another one was also to do with particularly the type of business that we are. I'm very client-facing. So I was actually, you know, when I was doing this, I was quite surprised because I, one of the tests I did was to look, it was basically an hour, but it was responding to emails from clients. And I was going through it at the time, and I kind of thought, this is a bit of a weird test. I was like, why am I, being, why am I doing this? But actually, it's about how you're interacting with people and how, you know, are you recognizing the types of situations people are in? And you're also recognizing the problem. Are you actually approaching the problem in the right way for the client? It's incredibly important from our business. So I would say in terms of the recruitment processes, you need to really think about what good looks like for you. Um, you know, if you believe that at the moment you feel like the grey criteria is what you want to be doing, you know, fine. But bear in mind, you will be missing out on some of the strengths of the sexy that we found out today. And I would say, start to challenge yourself on what you believe success could look like. You know, do we need to start thinking about how teams work together in rooms? You know, do we need to start how social elements, the human cognition elements, feed into actually how we work well together rather than just the outputs that we're doing? So I would say, really start challenging yourself on those areas. And I would say to start thinking about alternative ways of testing and playing to different people's strengths. And then at the end, obviously, you know, particularly for me, we have to have a, an interview with a senior leader, which is always a great experience. And particularly from our business, the senior leaders are so varied and fantastic. So it's, it, you, know, you, don't know what, you don't know what you're gonna get. But again, you're in a room and you're talking to someone about your passions, about your beliefs, about what you wanna achieve. And I think that is why you hire people. You know, that's why you want people who doesn't, you know, dyslexia or otherwise, you hire people because they're passionate about what they wanna be doing and they wanna work for your company. Thank you, Ben. Um, Stuart, one for you. Someone's asking, um, the support group provided training in this lecture for a number of local teachers who apparently they all now retired and they're asking whether there are any plans to train uh, teachers today. We have been working quite closely with the government, like I said earlier. Um, they have put on training um, for teachers recently. Um, I think they're still in the middle of doing that, so it's quite a long um, process. But that is something also that, you know, we, we carry on talking with the government in power and, you know, the, the parties for the next general election, that this needs to be an ongoing um, activity. It can't just be what happened uh, was back in the time when my mother was the chairperson of the Dissex Support Group. They trained up a number of teachers. Um, when I got involved about 15 years ago, um, those teachers were the only ones that hadn't been trained, so there was a vacuum. So um, we have been working closely with the government and we have managed to get a, a lot of teacher training, but the hope is that this will carry on on a yearly basis. Obviously, as you can imagine, it's very difficult to train teachers in schools because it's very difficult to get them out of the school to actually receive the training. So it needs to be done in a bit of a tiered way um, and, and we can they can release a certain amount of teachers at, at certain points, but they can't be just a blanket and just teach all the teachers 
in one go. So it, it takes a bit of time, but we are working on that and we, you know, just carry on with the government and just say, look, we, we think this teaching, this training needs to carry on annually to get to a point where all the teachers have a certain level of training with dyslexia. And as I, I've said before, you know, I'm very glad to say that, the, you know, the education department has been really good and working with us towards that goal. And I hope that, you know, um, going forward after the elections, whoever's in power, that will continue and we'll carry on seeing teachers getting the training. Because, you, you know, when I first got involved with the Dyslexic Support Group, to some extent, I blamed teachers. As a dyslexic going through the school system, you know, they're the ones that get the blame. And the parents as well, you know, a lot of the times we blame, we blame uh, teachers. But it's not the teacher's fault if they have not been given the tools, if they have not been trained, if they don't know, know how to recognize dyslexia. So this is why it's really important that we, we realize that a lot of teachers, and in my experience, the majority of teachers really want to learn. And you're probably, uh, uh, some of you in, in this room, a lot of the events we hold, uh, teachers are the main people who come to them. So they are eager. They are eager to learn. They are eager to, to do better. So don't blame the teachers a lot of the times. It's not really their fault. There's very little training in universities and in PGCs for, for teachers on dyslexia. And that is why, like we, said, we heard before, we need to push universities to bring it in, but also um, to carry on training locally, which we will we'll carry on doing. Now, you mentioned there, interestingly enough, the election, which is just a, a few weeks away. Brenda, you, the mother of a dyslexic child, um, we've identified a few things. Um, moving forward, what's at the top of your wish list? So I think that, um, you know, we've got these wonderful new schools that are coming in. And, um, you know, hopefully they've got the equipment and the tools and the teachers are being trained to deal with you know dyslexia and all the other special um, di learning disabilities that there are and I think that it's important that the you know as well as building you know spending money on buildings and all of that that we're actually giving them the tools because the buildings can be brilliant and the kids will enjoy them but if they're not actually getting the experience of the learning then that's what we need to look at so I know that some of the education departments have been looking at different um, other countries like Finland and their, you know, what they do. And I think that that's what we need to um, have that appreciation of that everybody learns differently. And it's not just, you know, one way of learning. And, you know, and if you don't conform to that, then that you can't do whatever it is that you need to do. So I think that it's that understanding and it would be great for the parties. Um, I'm sure that all of them are touched by somebody who has dyslexia. So if they can actually appreciate what it is that we need, that what we would like to see, um, I think it would make everybody's life easier. Changing a few systems, perceptions, perhaps uh, changing perceptions and understanding being the key to achieve all those other changes, right? Definitely. I mean, it is all about perceptions and it's all about you know, having that understanding and being able to, you know, see and embrace their difference, embrace that we, you know, as it's been said many times, um, the every dyslexic is slightly different. It's not the same format. So, um, you know, when my daughter went for her assessment in the UK um, on one of the assessment charts, she got um, the highest reading. She went like to page 30. And in his 27 years, she was the one that got the furthest. But then in other things, she couldn't, it, you know, she just couldn't, you know, on that percentile chart, she was very low. And, you know, so they say that you have to work to those strengths and not focus on the things that you can't do. Thank you, Brenda. Stuart, um, we're going to be wrapping up. But before we do, um, the Gibraltar Dyslexia Support Group, uh, thank you very much for having organized this. Um, Tell us about the kind of worker, uh, the services you offer the community. Um, well, like what I mentioned uh, before, um, I'm at the end of that number, so I'm always available to talk. We have also Facebook, Twitter, emails, so we're all at the end 
of these uh, media's platforms, so please get in touch. Um, I think a lot of the times it just helps someone to speak to somebody who knows what it's like to have a dyslexic child or to be dyslexic, I'm both. So, so it, it, it really helps to be able to just speak to somebody who knows what you're going through. And, and a lot of the times that is the, the, the basic thing that we do. We just are there as a, a shoulder to cry on kind of thing. But also obviously we, we do organize events and try and build up awareness in the general public and in the schools. So we, we do a variety of things, but I think at the core, it's just to try and be there. And as the word says, to be a support to, to parents, dyslexics, teachers, anyone who has any relation to dyslexia. Thank you, Stuart. A big thank you to you, Stuart, Brenda, Ben, Kate, um, His Excellency the Governor. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, your stories with us this morning. Also, a big thank you to the Federation of Small Businesses for having uh, collaborated with the Dyslexia Support Group uh, to make this event possible. And of course, our sponsors, the Consumer Trust, Hyperion Group of Companies, the Jibanko Group, uh, BrightMed, and EY. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for having uh, come down this morning and listened, listening being a very special key thing. And um, thank you very much. Um, the support group uh, contact details are in your program. Don't forget to follow them online. Thank you. Sorry. Can I just say one other thing? I think we should thank Kevin and give him a big round of applause, please. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>